Hey everybody, this is Dave McMacro. We're doing a review of major graphs here. I'm talking about the investment demand curve. When will you get introduced to the investment demand curve? Normally when you start talking about AD. Guys, the first thing you're normally going to get uh, introduced to when you start talking about aggregate demand, which is total spending, is the biggest component of spending, which is consumption. And so you'll be introduced to things like the consumption function. But the next thing you're going to be introduced to that is very important is investment. It's actually not as big of a component of AD as consumption, but it is very much arguably a more important component. And why is that? Well, look how I drew it. I drew it kind of weird. It's supposed to mean unstable. Investment is definitely the most unstable component of aggregate demand. It fluctuates the most. Guys, when the economy starts booming, investment picks up a lot. But when that economy crashes, investment demand can also decrease a ton. It's very unstable, and again, what's macroeconomics all about is trying to create stability in the economy, so there is a lot of focus on this component of AD. So that's why we're studying the investment demand curve. Now, as I start teaching the investment demand curve, I'm going to start with a single business, okay? And I've got this little stepwise function going on here. The idea is this, guys. Each of these letters, I want you to think, represents a project a single business is looking at, okay? Now, you see I've got percent right there, and what I'm looking at these percents as is I'm seeing them as the expected real rate of return. So, of course, what I mean is 0%, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, right? So that's what we should think we're seeing right here is a bunch of percentages. And so what I'm doing is I'm showing the expected real rate of return of these projects the business is thinking about doing. And here's my level of investment spending. Now, you might be thinking, why did I not go A, B, C, D? I intentionally said C, D, A, B to very much make the point that the way that we're going to put these, the order we're going to put these projects in is descending order. We're going to start with the project that has the highest expected real rate of return, and then we're going to go in descending order after that. It's an intentional way we're going to lay out these projects. Now, the next question is, which project is the business going to do? Well. Right now, you're just looking at the expected real rate of return, but a business needs to know what the real interest rate is before they decide which projects they're going to do. They will only do those projects for which the real interest rate is less than the expected real rate of return, right? The, the real interest rate is going to be their cost of borrowing money or it is what they're foregoing when they do a project. So it is absolutely part of the opportunity cost of doing a project. So before a business does a project, even though it might have an expected, you know, a positive expected real rate of return of projects, it's going to go and look at the interest rates and I'm only going to do those that have an expected real rate of return greater than the interest rate. So if the interest rate ended up being, I don't know, let's call this 7% right there, dash across, what projects would they do? C and D. Those have expected real rates of return greater than the real interest rate. They would not do A nor B. Now, that's a single business looking at four potential projects. When we go to macroeconomics and we start seeing the economy as a whole, we lose this stepwise function right there, right? This is very granular, okay? We have to be super zoomed in. When we zoom out and we start seeing all the millions of projects, okay, in an economy, when we start kind of graphing that, we're going to get what looks like just a linear line like this, okay? So investment demand from a macro view is a nice smooth line. But again, what lies inside of this curve, or maybe I should say underneath this curve, is this same principle. If you're not following me, guys, if I was to zoom way in on this graph, I would still see this stepwise function. Now, the difference, though, between maybe this and this and this and this could be fractions of a percent. But I would still see that stepwise function if I zoomed way in. But when I zoom out, see the economy as a whole, I see this nice smooth line, okay? So what is that line? Well, yes, it is the expected real rate of return of business projects. But guys, that is giving me my investment demand curve, okay? Not the best handwriting, that's supposed to be ERRR, -R -R, expected real rate of return of business projects, which gives my, me my investment demand curve. This right goes here is quantity of investment demand, you can say, investment spending. But guys, if you just say quantity of investment, that's fine. Because what is investment to an economist? That is businesses spending money. So quantity of investment, that's quantity of investment spending. What's this axis? 
Well, I've already kind of alluded to this, guys. It is the expected real rate of return, no doubt about it, but it is also the real interest rate. I know that might seem a little bit confusing, but what we're seeing this axis as is two different things. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a bunch of percentages. In fact, I sometimes even perk my percent sign to remind students it's a bunch of percentages, and we're seeing those percentages as both the expected real rate of return and the potential real interest rate, okay? So again, remember what I said here and how we come up with the investment demand curve. We put our projects in an order, a descending order, with the project with the highest expected real rate of return first, going to the lowest expected real rate of return. Same logic here, that's why this is downward sloping right there. And now, we've got something that's gonna communicate the amount of investment spending we're gonna do at in each and every real interest rate. Let me say that again. We're now got a graph that's going to communicate the quantity of investment spending we're going to get at every single real interest rate. You see, guys, if the real interest rate was right here, well, how much spending would we do? Well, we would do those projects that have an ER greater than this real interest rate, right? So remember, projects don't have interest rates, okay? Interest rates are set in markets. They're the cost of loanable funds, okay? Projects don't have interest rates. Projects have expected real rates of return. So if the loanable funds market says the interest rate is this amount right here, the real interest rate is that amount, what projects will we do? We will do those projects that have an expected real rate of return that is greater than the real interest rate. Now, let's get to the application, right? When are we gonna really be thinking about this a lot? A monetary policy and fiscal policy question. Let's do a monetary policy question. Let's say we're in a recession. So what's the Fed going to do? They're going to increase the money supply. They're going to do that to bring interest rates down. If that interest rate goes down, what's going to happen to the amount of investment we're going to do? Well, now there will be more projects with an ER greater than the real interest rate. We would do more projects. In other words, at the old interest rate, we would have done this amount of projects or that amount of investment spending is probably the best way to say it. By the way, guys, when I say this amount of project, when I say that, I'm saying in dollar term. We would spend that much money on projects, i.e. that would be the quantity of investment spending. When that real interest rate goes down, we would do more spending on investment projects. So that's the Fed doing easy monetary policy. And this is a relationship that we need to know, right? This is what I like to say is a 10 on a 10 scale. We need to know how the interest rate affects investment spending, okay? What's the impact of the interest rate on investment spending? Now, what's another big application in AP macro classes? The government runs a deficit, right? The government does expansionary fiscal policy. Again, trying to uh, stimulate the economy. But what would they do? They would lower taxes, increase government purchases, increase transfer payments. Maybe not all three, maybe only one, but maybe all three, but any of those three would cause the deficit to get bigger. That's the key, okay? They're trying to stimulate the economy, changing taxes to change disposable income, changing transfer payments to change disposable income, and changing government purchases to directly change spending, but that's gonna cause deficit. When they have deficits, they're gonna have to go borrow money from the financial market. That increase in the demand for local funds is gonna increase the interest rate. So, expansionary fiscal policy causes deficits, causes government to go borrow money, causing interest rates to go up, and when those interest rates go up, what's going to happen, guys? Well, the amount of investment spending we're going to do is going to decrease, right? So let's get rid of those right there. We were right here, let's say, okay, forget about that monetary policy action. Now that interest rate goes up, quantity of investment is going to drop. You see that decrease in investment spending? That's the crowding out effect. You see, government just crowded out businesses out of the financial markets, okay, by driving that interest rate up, making less projects profitable, right? There are now less projects that have an ER greater than the interest rate. There used to be all of these projects were greater than the interest rate, when that interest rate went up, only these projects have an ER greater than the real interest rate, investment's gonna drop. Guys, the relationship between the interest rate and quantity of investment or investment spending is a 10 on a 10 scale. This is the model for understanding that. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.